Tonight, as I'm sure you're all aware, is the Sunday, the Lord's Day, before our national election. It is the last sermon you may hear before you cast your ballot. It is appropriate for the man of God to give the people of God directions and principles from the Word of God to guide their conscience in how they ought to vote in choosing and selecting a worthy candidate. But that's not our purpose tonight. Tonight we come to the Supper of Remembrance. Tonight I invite you to turn your minds and hearts from the mess we're in to something glorious, to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is a topic that will lift you up from the mire of this world. Remember Bunyan's picture of the muckraker? Muckrakers there, mucking their, raking their muck, looking down, and that's all they see. I would lift up your eyes tonight to something much more delightful than the muck of this world. What is our hope? What are we about here at Trinity Baptist Church? Well, we're about the cross of Christ. Yes, it's much more. Yes, it involves the love of the brethren. Yes, it involves holiness of life. Yes, it involves sanctification. It involves so much. It's a big book. But the heart of it, the center, the heartbeat, if you will, is the cross of Christ. So I invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And may we never grow tired of hearing of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'd like to read verses 18 through 25. Follow with me in your own Bibles. As Paul writes here, in this church, to this church, which had a variety of problems, they had strife, they had factions, they had uh, immorality. There are all sorts of problems there. But here he says that he did not, he was not sent to baptize. Not that baptizing, of course, is bad. There's a baptistry behind me but to preach the gospel. And he says, For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let's pray and ask that God would thrill our souls with a fresh view of Christ and him crucified as we consider these words tonight. And that this would not in any way be old stuff, but good old stuff. And that it would thrill our souls once more with what we have in our Savior. Let's pray. Well, Lord, our God, we thank you for Jesus We thank you for Christ, who is your power and your wisdom for this word of the cross, which has come to us in power once we ignored it, once we turned our backs on it, once we yawned through it. But you gripped us. You laid hold of us. And you brought us to the foot of the cross to admire, to to, to, to trust to bask in your love, which is revealed as we have sung here in the cross of Jesus. And so we ask that you would melt our hearts once more. And for those whose hearts are still as hard as flint, that you would change those hearts and make them beat with life as you are able to do. Hear us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So as we look at especially verse 23 and 24 tonight, uh, we ask these three questions. What do we preach? And then secondly, to whom do we preach? And then thirdly, what is the result of our preaching? And so those three questions will form our outline this evening. What do we preach? And what we preach, Paul says very succinctly here in these couple of words, verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. Now, if you take those two words, of course, you can boil those down into two facets. There is the person of Christ and there is the work of Christ. And I could preach a whole series, a year's worth of sermons on those two things. But let me boil it down, condense it, and put that kettle on and keep it on the heat until we come down with the essence. What's the persons of Christ? The, the person of Christ? Well, we speak of his deity. Who is Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus is God. God the Son. God in flesh, his deity. If Jesus, the man that the Jews saw that we read of earlier as he was there before the Sanhedrin, there before the Jewish court, if this were just a mere man, our faith is in vain. And we're wasting our time here tonight. If Jesus was a great man, or even we might say a divinely empowered man, an inspired man, that would do you no good. If Jesus were the best example of a man, <laughs> so what? But he's God. And that makes all the difference because it is divine power that your salvation needs. It is divine power your sanctification needs. If you are going to get from this sin-cursed world and stand before God in glory, you need a divine Savior. You need God to save you, and nobody else can do it. Who is he? He is truly God, that is. He is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. This man, Jesus, that they saw walking before him, Jesus of Nazareth, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. All that God is, Jesus is and was and ever will be God, his deity. And we proclaim this from this pulpit, that yes, he was true man, and we'll come to that, but he was <laughs> so much more. He's God. We have a divine Savior. But furthermore, when we speak of Christ, we speak of his humanity because, as John put in the introduction of his gospel, not only was he the word who was God and who was with God and who was there at creation. And in fact, nothing was made without him. So he was obviously not made. We also read, and the word became flesh. He who ever was unchanging became in addition, what he had never been before, he became flesh. Here we have the marvel and the mystery of the incarnation. Now, uh, some of you may have a little acquaintance with the Philippines. And you know that the Philippine, if you don't know, I'm going to tell you now, the Philippine Christmas season begins September 1. So you have the Burr months, September, October, November, December. And so you walk into a shopping mall, September 1, and you hear Christmas carols. Well, some people find that a little, you know, overload. I personally don't mind hearing about my Savior coming to earth. Not that he was born. We know the date. We don't know the date. But to hear of my Savior coming to redeem helpless sinners. I don't mind hearing about that in songs in a shopping mall. This is a mystery. This is marvelous. And we're so accustomed to it here at Trinity Baptist Church. We know of the incarnation. Have you lost sight of the marvel that that babe in a manger was the one who created everything? The one sucking at his mother's breast is the one upholding all things by the word of his power. 
It's marvelous. And why did he do it again? Because without a divine human savior, there's no one who can save you. Yes, God does it, but he does it by putting a man in the place of fallen men. And we'll find out what he had, why he had to do that in order to do the work he had to do. But here we have God and man, two natures in one person. You say, that's, that's pretty deep. It is. And theologians have debated and, and discussed and worked out, tried to make a formula for how to describe the mystery of the two natures in one person for, for centuries. And you can study it. But brethren, never let these things go here at Trinity Baptist Church. We preach Jesus. We preach him God, we preach him as man. We preach a divine human savior. Kiss the son, the psalmist wrote, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Divine, human, to boil it all down. Who is Christ? That's who he is. Jesus, the son of God, made flesh, born of a virgin, born under the law, lived like you and me, except for one thing, without sin. That's his person. But he says we preach Christ crucified. And, of course, when we talk about the, word, the, the work of Christ, there's more to it than just the cross. There is his law-keeping work, his active obedience in which he actively, deliberately, decidedly, purposefully kept each one of God's laws, even from a child. Imagine that, kids. He never fought with his brothers and sisters. They might have tried to fight with him, but he didn't fight back. He never sinned. Two natures in one person. Here he is, God, holy God, but a true man. And he never sinned. He obeyed all God's holy law. Can you do that? What does James say about us? James says in James 3, 2, For we all stumble in many ways. Not just here and there. Not just once in a while. We all stumble in many ways, in many things. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Can you bridle your tongue? Do you sin in what you say? <sighs> we look back over the recording of our words that pass from our mouths with shame. But of Jesus, what does it say in the scriptures? The voice came from heaven, Matthew three seventeen, And behold, a voice out of the heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, exalted above the heavens. We have such a Savior who has a perfect righteousness. What do you need to stand before a holy God? How can you stand before him? Say, well, I, I've been a good person. You know, I wasn't as bad as my neighbor. He was a pretty rotten guy. Uh, I wasn't that bad. Is that going to wash? Young people, I wasn't as bad as my brother. Is that going to wash? You need a perfect righteousness. Only Jesus can give you that. His law-keeping work, but then the focus here in the text is on his cross work. Christ crucified, we preach. And here the apostle zeroes in on what is the heart of his message. Second Look at second chapter, verse two, he says, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, of course, you read the letter and you find out there's a lot more in this letter than just speaking of Christ crucified. We find out it deals with church discipline. It deals with the Lord's Supper. In fact, a passage that's most frequently read at the Lord's Supper is here in this very book. There's a lot in this book. But here's the heart of it. You boil it down. Christ and him 
crucified. The heart of the gospel, the substitutionary death. What do we proclaim when we take the cup and the bread? We proclaim his death until he comes. It's this substitutionary death, Jesus dying on the cross. Here's the message. If, you, if you've never got it before you, maybe you come to this church and, you know, things go in one ear and out the other. Get this. This is the gospel. Jesus, the Son of God, perfect God, holy God, and man, truly man, died on the cross. Why? If he was perfect, if he was sinless, if he was innocent, why did he die? Judas even proclaimed he was innocent. Herod proclaimed he was innocent. Pilate proclaimed he was innocent. Why did he die? Because he took on himself all the sins of all his people for all time. Dear friend, if you're not in Christ, all your sins are still on you. If you come to Christ, he takes those sins away and he will pay for them. Who can do that? Could you do that for me? We can't do it for ourselves. He, being God and man, could do it for all his people. All the blood of bulls and rams in the Old Testament, all those Old Testament sacrifices showed the people of God of the Old Covenant, sin is serious business. And if you were an Old Testament Jew and you had to bring your bull and your goat and your, maybe your sheep and you had to see it slaughtered and its blood poured out before the altar. Think about it, kids. It's a bloody mess. What would that teach you? Sin is serious business. What can that sheep, can that bull even, a massive bull, can that bull's blood pay for my sin? And there should have been a voice down deep in your heart saying, it's just an animal. It's just animal blood. I'm a man made in God's image. What can avail? What will suffice to pay for my sin? Not all the blood of bulls and beasts on Hebrew altars slain. That couldn't satisfy your conscience and give it peace. It's not enough. Ah, but Christ the heavenly lamb bears all our sins away. There's the sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. This sin, human sin, demands a sacrifice Sufficient. It demands the death of the Son of the thrice holy God. And again, remember, what's the lesson? You can't sin and get away with it. Sin is serious business. Young people, you know, maybe you, you, you've heard these things and you hear about sin and sinners and you say all this stuff about sin. I'm tired of hearing about sin. Listen to me. You're going to hear about it in the last day. It's better you hear about it now. And you face it, what are you going to do with your sin? If you face it on your own, what then? But there's a sacrifice. Christ and him crucified. Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain, the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. Here is the sacrifice. Sufficient for all who come to him. And so again, this is what we preach. That's what Paul said he preached. We preach Christ crucified. Of course, he preached a lot more. Yes, we preach the fruit of the gospel. We preach the love of the brethren, as you heard this morning. Because you see, if Christ died for you and he pardoned your sin, you better follow through by having a forgiving heart that will pardon the sin of your brethren. Or you, don't, you, or you demonstrate that you never tasted that gift of forgiveness yourself. Yes, we preach all of those things. But we never lose this focus. We preach Christ and him crucified. That's what we're about here with the table. 
Christ crucified. Ho-hum, I've heard that before. I hope you never get tired. I love to tell the story, one of my favorite old hymns. It did so much for me. It did so much for me. And that's just the reason I tell it now to thee. To whom do we preach is the second question. That's what we preach, going back to the text. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. You see, he's talking about preaching to the whole world. And he divides the world in his day into two types of people. Remember, this is the Greco-Roman world, the Roman Empire. And there's Israel off to the, well, let's back my, my map on the other direction. Over on this side, as you look at it. And there's Israel, and there are the Jews. But the whole Roman Empire, they're scattered all over through that Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was really the great greco Empire, Greco-Roman Empire. And so he speaks of uh, Jews and Greeks, verse 22. And then he speaks of Jews and Gentiles, verse 23. And then he speaks again of Jews and Greeks, verse 24. So when I talk about Jews and Greeks, just like Paul, I'm talking about everybody. Now, I know we have a few Jewish believers from a Jewish background here in this congregation. And we have some from a Greek background in this congregation. I'm not picking on you. I'm talking about everybody here under these two categories, because that's how the Greco-Roman world could be divided in his day. And so we talk to everybody, the whole wide world. We preach Christ to all of you. In fact, he goes on and says that, or he says it. What has not God made foolish? The wisdom of the world, since in the wisdom of God, verse 21, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of preaching, preaching to the world to save those who believe. And so we preach to everybody. So don't think, kids, you're too young. And don't think, old gray beard, you're too old. Or don't think, if you're from a different culture, well, that's, that's white man religion. <laughs> it's for everybody, the world. But then he kind of divides it up. And so here we have the world divided into Jews and Greeks. Now, again, we're not picking on Jews just as a picture, though, of one type of person. And, you know, uh, though we do have in our congregation some from a Jewish background and their type still exists in that nation or in that race, but the, the Jew is a picture of the religious man. He's a type of the wise man. When he says back here in verse, uh, where did it go? Verse 20, where is the wise man? Kind of a generic statement. Where is the scribe? Well, the scribes, you see, were the Jewish wise men. Where is the debater of this age? Think Paul and the Areopagus. It's the Greek wise man. So you get Greek wise men and Jewish wise men. And they all failed. The Jewish wise man is this upright person. You see him as, as the Pharisee in the temple. I thank you, God. I'm not like other men. Not like this tax collector, for sure. I'm good. I pay tithes. I fast. I'm a good person. Now, is that type died out after Jesus' day? Has he? Or do we not meet him every day? I'm a good person. You're talking about these sinners. You're talking about this. I don't need that. I go to church. I even pay tithes. I go to church more than some of your members there. I'm a good person. I pay my taxes. I don't hurt my neighbors. In fact, I help my neighbors. They need something. They come over to borrow a cup of sugar. I'll give them two cups of sugar. That's the kind of guy I am. Has this person died out? He's still around. And maybe I'm talking to some here. Maybe you grew up in this church and you think, well, I don't do what these other people do. You know, I don't know why these preachers keep going on about sin and sinners. Vile sinners. What's a vile sinner? That's you. That's me. That's all of us. 
in the sight of God. This Jewish man puts his thumbs through his suspenders and boasts about how good he is. Now, you know, it says about the Jews, they ask for signs, verse 22. And that's true. You look back at the gospel accounts and Jesus just feeds 5,000. Now, he has a few loaves and a few fish and he breaks them all up and he feeds 5,000. 4,000, I think we read this morning. And you go to the next chapter and it says, and the Jews came to him, give us a sign from heaven. Wait a minute. Did you just eat that bread? And did you just see that there was no source? There was no bread store. There was no bakery in sight. You get it? Give us a sign. Jesus heals. And I look back through the gospel accounts to get some of the specific details. Jesus heals a man who is deaf and blind or dumb and blind. And Jesus casts out the demon and the man sees and speaks. And right after that, the Jews say, give us a sign. Duh. You know, if I may speak colloquially. Duh. Get it. He has demonstrated who he is. Jews ask for a sign. Well, Jesus told them, all right, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. No sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. What's the sign of Jonah? Well, Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish. As it were, buried under the sea. Gone, out of sight. That's what happened to Jonah. I say Jesus, Jonah. And Jesus was buried in the tomb. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and he came forth. That's the sign of Jonah. And you have it. We have a risen Savior, seen by 500 at one time, demonstrated to have risen from the dead. And so there's the sign. Are you that person who thinks you're good enough? Here's the question. Maybe you're a religious person. Maybe even say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But I'm, I, I'm a good person. Get this. If you're so good, why would God send his son to die on a cross if he didn't have to? If you're good enough without it. Now, you remember what Jesus said? I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. If you think you're righteous... You have no part in Christ. No, the Jews, but we still preach to them. Christ crucified. How about the Greeks? Well, again, I'm not picking on Greeks as a nation, but a type of the Gentiles. He calls them Gentiles in verse 23. Uh, Gentiles, these are non-Jews, and, and they're the philosophers. They're another type of wise man, the debater of this age, wise in their own eyes, too wise to believe in a divine human Savior, too wise to believe in a crucified Savior. That's, that's nonsense. It's a stumbling block. God who would become man... Man who would, uh, God who would give himself by becoming man to die? That's nonsense. And maybe, dear young people, listen to me. I grew up in a church similar to this. I grew up memorizing Bible verses. I grew up singing hymns. And I got to high school. And lo and behold, 10th grade confronted a teacher who said, well, Jesus was just a good man. You know what this 10th grade boy did? He said, yeah, that makes sense. Tossed out. Oh, I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell my... I went to church, like you are. But in my heart, I tossed it out. I was too wise. Who can believe this stuff? Where's the debater of this age? It's foolish. I can't believe that. Greeks search for wisdom. Too proud to believe a gospel that tells them that they are 
sinners. And so what do they worship? You have to worship something. So you worship money. You worship yourself. You worship your girlfriend, your boyfriend. You worship husband, wife, or children if you're older. You worship your job, your stuff. No. No. Greeks call it foolishness. But you know what? As I said, we still preach to them. We preach Christ crucified. We continue to hammer this. We continue to display him before you. A savior, God in flesh, who died on the cross, yes, and rose again and lives and reigns in glory. We preach. Because why? Such were some of us. Titus 3.3, we also were once foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. And what made the difference for us? Christ and him crucified. And we still preach him. So what's the result? Coming to the third point then. If that's to whom we preach, we preach to everybody, all kinds of people. What's the result? Well, Mr. Jew gives his verdict. What does he say? Verse 23, to Jews, a stumbling block. There's the verdict. Mr. Jew says, skandalon. That's Greek for a stumbling block. You might paraphrase, if you will, and say, it's scandalous. Who can believe that? A crucified Savior? Skandalon. Stumbling block. I can't accept that. How about the Greeks? What do they say? Mr. Greek, what's your verdict? That's foolishness. Morian. It's moronic, if I could paraphrase the Greek. That's moronic to believe that. Christians are a bunch of morons, a bunch of idiots. Don't you get that from the world? I mean, Mr. Greek, he's all over the place in our day and age. Mr. Jew says, I won't believe unless I see a sign. I want to see somebody rise from the dead. Well, there you got Jesus. I want to see a miracle. They're all over the Bible. Mr. Greek says, I'm not going to be duped by that. I'm too smart for this claptrap. Look at the world, the, the, the mess the world's in. What has your wisdom done for you? Look at what he says. In the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. What do you get from worldly wisdom? The mess we's in. That's what you get. <laughs> I mean, you think it's a better world? <laughs> no, no. You take the foolishness of Mr. Greek, you take the postmodernist foolishness, and you get, you know, even their foolishness, you can deconstruct it and, and you can throw it back in their face and it's foolishness. Um, and what do you get? You get conflict, chaos, and no, no end in sight. Well, what do we have? We have Christ and him crucified. And is it hopeless then to preach this to people who are going to say, that's nonsense or that's a scandal? Is it hopeless? Well, look around the room. Is it hopeless? Of course not. Why? Because to those who are called, There it is in the text. To those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so there's an effectual call to this gospel. And I thank God for that as I stand here this evening. When I stand to preach, it is not depending on my skill, on my eloquence, on my word of wisdom that I get out of myself. No, not my persuasive words of wisdom. It's the, the message of Christ and him crucified. And you see, in the wisdom and power of God, he has called or he has chosen and is calling people to himself. Now, I can't tell who you are just, you know, by looking at your face. Well, this one's called that one. Now forget about it. You don't know who they are that God's going to call. But you know And this is what gives preachers hope. (laughs) This is what gives us certainty. That we're not about a fool's errand. Because God has his chosen ones. And in time, at the right time, 
They're going to be the called. And that effectual call will come and grip them. And there's power in that effectual call. Think about it. You got a tax collector. And the tax collectors were notorious in Jesus' day. <coughs> and they're, they're, you know, they get their money and they get their quota and then everything else goes in their pocket. Uh, and, and they spend it on what? On lust, on, on themselves, on their uh, frivolous desires. Here's this tax collector, rich, rich man. And he gets curious. What's this Jesus? I've heard about this Jesus. What's, what's he look like? I mean, they say that he even eats with sinners. What, what, what about me? Would he? And he's a little guy. Some of us can relate. And he wants to see Jesus. He's, he can't see him. And so you know the song, kids, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree, the Lord he wanted to see. And the Savior passed by and said, Zacchaeus, you come down from there. I'm going to your house today. And what did Zacchaeus do? <laughs> this nonsense. Oh, There's a stumbling block. Uh, uh. He came down. <laughs> and he went. And he said, I'm going to give half what I own. And I'm going to repay back anybody I defrauded. This is the power of the gospel. And, you know, you could multiply that. You can think of Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He's going to kill Christians. <laughs> and God turns him around. You think of Peter. He's out there with his fishing nets. Peter, follow me. He leaves his fishing nets. You think of Steve. You think of Dave. You think of Bart, Jeff, Shazad, you think of Jane, Sarah, Jose, P all, you think of all you, if I can speak New Joysian. It's the power of the gospel that took you and you and you. Isn't it so? There's power to those who are called Christ, the power of God. It's power that takes those who are rebellious, those who are hard hearted, those who are intellectual. Those who are too stubborn, those who are too smart for their own good and turns them around and makes them Christians. That's what happened to us. You know, kids, you may think, man, what happened to my dad? He's crazy. My mom, why, why are they going about this? It's the gospel got hold of us. The power of God and the wisdom of God. And so uh, there we were. In church, you know, or maybe uh, listening to the radio or maybe on the Internet and or maybe picked up a book. Or maybe like me, you went to a youth camp and there's the preacher preaching away and you haven't got a clue what he's saying. But something, something gets through. Boom. Christ, the power of God. There's power in the gospel. God tracked you down, subdued your heart. Called you to himself. Praise my soul, the God that sought thee. Wretched wanderer far astray. Found thee lost and kindly brought thee from the paths of death away. Praise with love's devoutest feeling. Him who saw thy guilt-born fear and the light of hope revealing. Bade the blood-stained cross appear. Praise the grace whose threats alarmed thee. Rouse thee from thy fatal ease. Praise the grace whose promise warmed thee. Praise the grace that whispered peace. And brethren, there's still power in the cross. You're still struggling with sin. You say, okay, there's power, but I still got a problem. I got a problem with pornography. I got a problem with anger. I got a problem with my tongue. I, got, I still got problems. I still have sin. Go to the cross. You have a problem with pornography? You go to the cross. You look to the cross. And if you look to the cross, I'm not talking about crucifixes. I'm not talking about images or idols. I'm talking about you consider Christ and him crucified. And you're, then you're going to go look at porn. You got a problem with your tongue, with anger. And God poured out his wrath on his son. And you're going to go then and blow your cool at a fellow sinner. When God did that for you, you go back to the cross again and again. There's power in the cross. The word of the cross is to those who are called power. 
Go back again and again. And ultimately, in the last day, there's power that's going to raise us. I watched the service for Pastor Gary Hendricks this afternoon. He's there with his Savior. <laughs> you know, it kind of almost makes you envy. Well, it does. He's there. He's done with the doubters. He's gone up with the shouters. As dear old Billy Bray put it. There's power in the cross. But furthermore, there's wisdom. There's wisdom in the gospel. The world makes sense now. History makes sense. Science makes sense. Why? Because there's a creator. You, you're trying to make sense of the world outside of that. You got entropy, you got enthalpy, you got all this stuff. And you try to put it all together and you, your mind boggles. But when you go to God, who's divinely orchestrating all things, all this science, and I'm an engineer, falls into place and makes sense. The gospel has wisdom. Here's a, here's a conundrum for you. How can a righteous God righteously accept the unrighteous as righteous? Figure that one out. A righteous, holy God hates sin. And here are sinners. How can a righteous God righteously declare the unrighteous to be righteous? You say, it's impossible. It's possible with the cross of Christ. Here's wisdom. Nobody could figure it out. Nobody could do it. But God did it. Here's wisdom in the gospel of Christ. And so, as we wind up this evening, well, what's the message for us? Brethren here at Trinity Baptist Church, you know, some of your pastors have gray hair, gray beards, and who knows? You watch a funeral service for a pastor, and the thought comes, that's going to be me one day. And my mouth is going to be silent in the grave. Brethren here at Trinity Baptist Church, some of you younger ones, I know there's some older than me here, but you younger brethren, be determined. This pulpit is going to still preach Christ and Him crucified. And if anything else comes in here over my dead body, we're going to still proclaim this gospel. Yes, in all of its richness. Oh, yes, in all of its implications. All that it means for the love of the brethren. All that it means for walking in godly living throughout our lives. All that it means in terms of turning away from every known sin. Yes, we're going to preach all that. Dealing with sin in the church, church discipline, the Lord's Supper, all that we find even in this very letter. We're going to preach it all. We're going to keep coming back to Christ and Him crucified. And let us then praise God for and rejoice in this gospel. What a gospel. Again, wisdom. You couldn't have cooked this up in a thousand years. But here it is. This is the way that you, a sinner, can be right in the eyes of a holy God. There's no other way. No other hope. No other name. This is the gospel. This is the truth. This is the way. Jesus himself, his person, his work. But then let's just step back and see what God has done. You know, uh, 2020, I can't help but, uh, we were talking in the car on the way here, I can't help but sometimes struggle with a little heaviness of heart. I don't know, I'll be honest with you, I'll bear my soul. This year has been a tough year. And you look around with the stuff going on in our country, the election, the turmoil, uh, the virus, and you say, well, this is a mess. And you can be discouraged. It can drag you down. It's a broken world. I used to tell our kids, and I've mentioned it before, it's a sin-cursed world. What do you expect? But here you see, we lift up our eyes. We have Christ and Him crucified. And not only Him crucified, dead, buried, and that's it. Risen from the dead, ascended in heaven, and returning in glory. That's what we have in this gospel. And think about it. All right, some of us, maybe next year, this time, we won't be here anymore. I don't know. You don't know either. But think about it, you brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ. There you are in glory with the presence of your Savior. 
and you're looking back over your life and over the trials and over the difficulties and the discouragements and the disappointments, yes, and even the times of depression. You look back over it all and you say, here I am in glory. That was no big deal. 2020, that was a mud puddle in the path to glory. was a mud puddle in the path to glory lift up your eyes because we preach Christ and him crucified the power and the wisdom of God a savior who is Christ the Lord joy to this world and so don't forget as you're there in the presence of God looking back (laughs) have that perspective even now Lift up your eyes. As I read in my devotions this morning in Isaiah 44, this verse stood out. Isaiah 44, 23. Shout for joy, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout joyfully, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into a shout of joy, you mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob, and in Israel he shows forth his glory. (laughs) If you've been redeemed... Yeah, this world can be a pretty depressing place. But if you're redeemed, break forth in shouts of joy. That's where we're bound. And if you're not yet his, and maybe you're sitting there with your arms crossed, and you're saying, I'm like those Jews he talked about. I'm a pretty good person. I don't know why I don't get this reviled sinner stuff. Or maybe you're there like the Greeks saying, oh, this is a bunch of poppycock. A, a, A God who became man? You know what? That was me many years ago. But God can take you where you are and turn you around. That's my prayer. I was sitting here before we started. Lord God, you're almighty. Nothing's too difficult for you. Come in power. Arrest hearts and minds tonight. Turn them from the world to seek your son. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your gospel is your power and your wisdom and that you can take it and take it home to hearts and save. And we know that this does not depend on the skill of the preacher, on the uh, wisdom, on the eloquence, on the gift of gab. It is your spirit's work to take Christ and him crucified, bring it home to the heart and save. And for your people, we confess that we still struggle with sin of one type or another. Help us to look to the cross. Help us to come back again and again to the cross. To our Savior who endured all this for us. And rather than make us complacent, rather than make us uh, take for granted the salvation that we have in Him, may it have the effect of causing us to hate sin all the more and turn away from it in revulsion and follow the Savior where He leads. We ask it because you are able to do more than we ask or think. In Jesus' name, amen.